Section 28 of The Wounded Name by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Eileen. Chapter 9, Part 3, 5. Laurent began by listening with avidity to the story of the coming of Monsieur de Vaubernier that night to the Presbytère of saint Croisec with a letter, and his interview with Colonel Richard. But, as the latter's evidence went on, he listened with inward maledictions also. How was it possible for anyone to be such a fool as that old gentleman? Not only, in a sense, to have originated the whole situation in his turnip of a brain, but also to have played, in such a preposterous manner, right into the hands of this intelligent colonel of engineers, by revealing that the enemy proposed a bargain with him, before finding out whether a bargain were called for at all. How could he not have seen, from Colonel Richard's manner that night, that there was no question of shooting anybody, even though the imperialist had, as now appeared, been too astute to display his entire ignorance of the lady's presence at the inn? Laurent's disgust got the better of his interest. He heard, however, at one point, questions eliciting exactly what was in the letter, and also a sharp query as to why it had not been laid before the court, to which Aymar briefly replied that it had subsequently been destroyed by a third person. He heard, too, the imperialist being asked what his thoughts were at the moment of the letter's reception, and his frank response that as it appeared to be genuine, he was driven to one of two suppositions, either that Loiselard was a traitor, and was deliberately selling his men for the safety of a woman whom he believed to be in mortal peril, or that the whole thing was a trap. He therefore went over to the Cheval Blanc to find out what possible grounds Loiselard could have for believing the lady to be in such a situation, and got on the track of the truth, though he did not run the culprit to ground till after the fight. And what was the truth, Colonel? asked the voice as he paused. Laurent put his hands over his ears. But he heard, or seemed to hear, all the same. He certainly heard the sonorous voice of the Chevalier de Marcadelle exclaiming, with astonishment, And then do you mean to tell us that the whole question of the lady's danger, and all that hung on it, rested on no more solid basis than a practical joke? I am ashamed to say that it is so, replied Colonel Richard. Aymar, sitting at his table, had his head on his hand. Laurent knew how bitter this must taste, how the shadow of ridicule, hard as the fall to face, must seem to be hovering near him, and though really it was engulfed in the shadow of tragedy. None of the court, at least, appeared to find this revelation amusing, and Laurent was grateful to them. He was not so sure about one or two of the younger officers in the audience, as he scanned in particular one whose demeanour did not please him, he heard Colonel Richard resuming his evidence and saying how he considered the letter worth acting on, with precautions, as he thought that a leader with the experience and antecedents of Monsieur de la Cochetique had probably taken steps to nullify the information he had sent, nor, as between one soldier and another, did he consider that unfair, merely a move in the game. So I took every precaution that I could think of, he concluded, and the result you know. But I desire, gentlemen, to make it very plain that if Colonel de saint Etienne's regiment had not been ordered away from Caraven when it was, I, not knowing at the moment of his presence in the neighborhood, might well have been the victim of disaster instead of Monsieur de la Cochetterie. Laurent could see that this testimony had made rather a strong impression the court conferred together. And then the Marquis de Boisillac observed, In fact, you are convinced that Monsieur de la Gauchetigui is speaking the truth. I am, absolutely. I should hardly have agreed to come and give evidence at the request of a former adversary if I thought him a traitor. Perhaps, said Colonel Richard, drawing himself up a little, I may be allowed to say that I think too much of my own reputation for that. He returned to his place, and Aymar stood up again. It seems pretty well proved, Monsieur de la Rochetterie, said Monsieur de la Boissière, looking at his notes, 
that you had sufficient grounds for thinking the lady to be in danger. But do you consider that you were justified in taking such a risk for the sake of any individual, of whatever sex or services? But I have already stated, mon général, replied Aymar steadily, for what reasons I considered that there was practically no risk. And he rehearsed them once more. You had then no scruples about sending the letter. Oh, I had scruples because I disliked the whole idea, but not on the score of risk. Your perceptions must have been singularly clouded at the time, Monsieur de la Cocheterie observed a dry voice. And the risk appears, to me at any rate, to have been more than obvious. The shaft drew blood. Laurent saw it whose perceptions would not have been clouded at that dizzy moment in the orchard, the meeting-place of rapture and despair. But after a second a mark recovered himself and said gravely, I'm not speaking of how it appears to me now, monsieur, but giving evidence as to how it appeared to me then. I think we should remember, said the general-in-chief, suddenly interposing, that Monsieur de la Gaucheterie's whole military career has been one of taking risks, and very successful ones, and that familiarity is apt to breed contempt. Someone here observed that it would certainly be very hard, too, for a gentleman to leave a lady in such a situation, and particularly when he had the means of saving her to his hand. Or a man, either, if it comes to that, murmured a voice. And on this, Monsieur de Sequillon, who knew the identity of the lady, remarked, presumably with the idea of giving Aymar some support. Moreover, as it was for Monsieur de la Gaucheterie himself, and that the lady had obtained that military information, it is easy to understand that he felt under a special obligation to her. Oh, you fool, said Laurent to himself. The Marquis de Boissiac looked at the speaker. Oh, Monsieur de la Gaucheterie himself was the leader in question, was he? Then she was personally known to him. Is that so, Monsieur de la Cocheterie? I do not think we had gathered that. Laurent would not even look at his friend's back here. He looked, against his will, at the deeply interested audience. Yes, said Aymar briefly. Oh, how well? You must pardon the question. A tiny pause. She was my cousin, I see, said Monsieur de la Boissière. He might not have meant his tone to sound significant. It could hardly avoid doing so. Among the audience there was an undoubted and rather pleasurable stir, and on the face which Laurent had already singled out for dislike, a grin which made the young man clench his hands. However, the court intimated that Aymar should proceed with his narrative. He did so. He recalled the innkeeper, to prove that he arrived at three in the morning at Caravaine, was greatly distressed at finding the troops gone, and set off at once on a fresh horse. And he had carried his recital as far as the Bois de Fauvettes, when an objection occurred from the thin, dark-faced officer who had made the observation about clouded perceptions. This individual suggested that Loiselag should produce some witness to prove that he really did his best after he left Caravaine to arrive in time to prevent a disaster. Oh, otherwise, he observed, you might have planned to arrive too late. Oh, bosh, cried Laurent internally, now fixing this objector with a hostile eye. Aymar replied that he could hardly prove that, the only witness to his haste, failing the dead body of the horse which he had killed by it, and the quarryman whom he had intimidated into selling him another, would again be the innkeeper to whom he had paid the value of the first. But, he added, should I have rejoined my men at all the same morning? Oh, that ought to settle him, thought Laurent. But instead he found that this keen-witted person was landing his friend in a new and unforeseen difficulty, for, having elicited that de Fresne, the next witness, had not appeared in the Bois de Fauvettes till the afternoon of Monday, May 1st, he pointed out that there was no evidence to show that he did rejoin his force the same morning. For a moment, Aymar seemed taken aback. And then he rallied. Oh, I can produce it indirectly, monsieur, he returned. If monsieur du Tremblay will be so obliging, 
he can tell you that I dispatched one of my officers to him, early on the morning of April 29th, to warn him that I could not now cooperate with him. This officer, Monsieur de Solange, no doubt gave him an account of my return. Even if he did not, his mission itself was a proof of it. He looked towards his one-time ally. Now Monsieur de Tremblay was sitting at the extreme left hand of the table and round the corner of it. He was not, therefore, directly facing a mag, like the majority of the court. And all along, it seemed to Laurent, he had taken advantage of his position not to look at him. All through the business about the lady, of whose identity and antecedents he certainly knew as much as Monsieur de Séquillon, he had never given a sign. And when he addressed the president now, his tone was curt. Oh, I can perfectly well corroborate that, he said. And indeed he went on to relate how Monsieur de Soulange had given him a circumstantial account of Loiselog's return, in haste and fatigue, just after the disaster. Laurent was puzzled by his manner, but it dawned upon him that he was probably deeply distressed at seeing Loiselog at the bar before him. At least this seemed likely from his next words. May I take this opportunity of pointing out to the court, he went on, and though it is not exactly the question at issue now, and that a traitor would never have sent that message, he would, on the contrary, have seized the opportunity of letting me blunder into disaster, too, and by keeping silence. And through Monsieur de la Rochetterie's timely warning, I was able to alter my plans a little, and, as you know, I was fortunate enough to bring off one of the successes of the campaign. Further, if M. de la Rochetterie had had treacherous intentions, he would undoubtedly have made use of the intimate knowledge of our joint plans which he possessed. And this, it is clear, he did not do. And no, he most certainly did not, observed Laurent, his sotto voce. A murmur, almost of applause, went round. Aymar thanked the speaker and resumed his narrative, carrying it up to the unexpected arrival of de Fresne in the wood, at which point he called Monsieur de Fresne himself. Oh, please tell the court, Monsieur de Fresne, he said, turning to him, how you knew of the step I had taken, and how you represented to me the only way out. So Nicolas de Fresne, standing at the witness table, with an expression of concentrated distaste about his whole person, cleared his throat and began abruptly. I was taken prisoner at the bridge, knocked on the head. When I was sufficiently recovered, Colonel Guichard sent for me. It was at saint croix showed me my own letter to Monsieur de la Rochetterie, and told how it had come into his hands. And being rather startled, I asked him to let me have it back, and I had it on me when I escaped during the night of April 30th. When I reached the... Monsieur de la Boissière leant forward. One moment, please. We must go back a little. Colonel Richard presumably told you and that Monsieur de la Rochetterie had himself sent your letter to him. And did you immediately believe that? Oh, no, certainly not, responded de Fresne. But he succeeded in convincing you. No, I was not convinced. But you were shaken. Yes, muttered the witness. Why? De Fresne did not answer for a moment. Then he said slowly, because Monsieur de la Rochetterie had written something on the letter, and I knew his hand. What was it? Since his lieutenant seemed to find a difficulty in replying, Aymar hereupon got up himself and said rather dryly, Monsieur de Fresne had written part of his letter in cipher, so I deciphered that portion before sending it. It was of no use trying to drive a bargain with a letter at all, unless the information it contained was quite clear. As he sat down again, Lucon reflected. Of course, that is perfectly logical, but it does not sound well, and de Fresne has not done any good by being unable to get it out. It merely puts the dot on the eye. Indeed, the raising of eyebrows and compressing of lips in the court showed that he was right. De Fresne, however, was allowed to resume, and related how, returning, he asked his leader for an explanation, 
and how the latter told him that he had sent the letter as a ruse, but that the scheme had miscarried, and how. "'And what did you think of this explanation?' asked M. de la Boissière. Oh, "'I must admit that I found it inadequate. "'And yet, M. de la Rochetterie has been at such pains to prove "'that the plan was so complete and void of risk, "'and that he very nearly carried it out, "'with no other motive than a desire to trap the Bonapartists.' "'De Fresne shifted uneasily. "'Why did you not accept this explanation?' It was after the disaster had occurred, and the risk then, naturally, seemed indefensible. The unknown dark officer, whom Laurent had already christened Fouquier Tinville, leant forward. Oh, your two replies do not tally, Monsieur de Fresne. If you found the explanation inadequate, as you admit, it must be that you had some other reason than that you considered the risk indefensible. The latter would be merely a case of condemning your leader's judgment. Which reply are we to accept? I suppose, replied de Fresne reluctantly, I must say that I considered the explanation inadequate. And why? A slight pause. Because I knew from what Colonel Guichard had said and that there was a bargain of some sort. And had not Monsieur de la Cocheterie told you that? No. And did you ask him anything about it, as you knew of its existence? Yes, and he admitted it, but he would not tell me what it was. All well, the inference being, remarked Fouquier Tinville, and that he was ashamed of it. Why, I did not know what to think, admitted de Fresne unhappily. Monsieur de Margadelle here said in his great voice, Why on earth should he not have told you what the bargain was, if there was nothing to be ashamed of? And because, said Aymar, suddenly rising to his feet, Seeing what had happened, I was ashamed of it. And there was a sensation. A large, stout, heavy-faced officer at the end of the table said, in an annoyed voice, Oh, I should like to know, at this point, what Monsieur de la Rochetterie is driving at. His witnesses seem to do nothing but bring out damaging admissions, and then he makes them himself, gratuitously. And his mumble to himself of, There's something behind all this, was distinctly audible. Aymar was rather stung. Laurent could see it from the poise of his head. "'My object, monsieur,' he retorted, "'is merely to tell the exact truth "'in the hope of clearing myself. "'I have no other aim.' "'Once more de Fresne was requested to proceed. "'This time he got almost without interruption to the crisis, "'which he managed to represent as a few of the men "'leaving the wood in panic, "'shooting at and wounding their leader.' on whom they had previously laid hands. But at that point he was not unnaturally questioned. Oh, you could not stop all this insubordination. Oh, I did my best, but since Monsieur de la Rochetterie himself could not control the men. Oh, what was Monsieur de la Rochetterie doing all this time, then? Oh, I told you, answered de Fresne hurriedly, and they disarmed him and were holding him. He could do nothing. And then, when the alarm came, they let him go. No. But they could hardly have shot him while some of their accomplices were holding him. And de Fresne looked at the floor. Oh, by that time they'd tied him to a tree. It was out, at last, pronounced in words, and caused a silence, but hardly a merciful one. And the eyes, the eyes on a mad, if Laurent could only have shielded him from them. And the questioner's voice took up again. And he was found like that by the imperialists. Yes, answered de Fresne sullenly. Oh, it could not be helped. Aymar, horribly pale, got up, as if he feared his subordinate was going to be blamed, and corroborated this, adding that Monsieur de Fresne did his best to free him. He sat down again in the same tingling silence. It was the stout officer who broke it. And did Monsieur de la Gauchetterie, he asked, addressing the witness, let his men proceed to such an extremity without any attempt to defend himself? It looks as if his followers were so convinced of something against him that no explanations of his were of any avail. Surely the Chouan, 
of whom we all have experience, will accept anything so long as his faith in a leader is unshaken. But to this de Fresne replied that their faith was badly shaken, both by the disaster and the loss of the Chatillier, and that, in addition, Le Bihan, and the ringleader, was nursing a grudge. Now came endless questions about the Chatillier, how, when, and why lost, and then about Magloire, through all which Laurent's heart was slowly descending to the region of the floor, reaching it completely, when the theory was finally evolved between Fouquier Tinville, the stout officer, and one other, that something pointing to deliberate treachery must have come out in the unaccounted for three days between Aimac's return and de Fresne's escape. And why had Monsieur de la Rochetterie brought no evidence to cover those three days? Was he refraining from producing the only people who could tell him why they did shoot him? Aimac, whose voice to Laurent's ear, who was beginning to show the first signs of the strain on him, admitted that he had not thought of it, considering that the testimony of Monsieur de Fresne, who had been present throughout the episode, was sufficient to show on what grounds his men had turned against him. And then the stout officer said, oh, We must hear something more about the shooting itself, and how deliberate it was. Oh, that is very important. Was it as hurried and casual as you seem to apply, Monsieur de Fresne? Oh, it can hardly have been, if Monsieur de la Rochetterie was tied to a tree. Did they proceed to do that only just before they shot him? No, not exactly, admitted de Fresne unwillingly. Oh, how long before, then? Oh, it must have been between half an hour and three quarters. And in all that time nobody protested. Oh, yes, a good many, but they were not so strong as the other party. And did not Monsieur de la Rochetterie himself protest? Once. But when Le Bihan gave him the opportunity of justifying himself, he refused to say a word, as I should have done in his place. And then they never got the explanation, such as it was. Oh, yes, I gave it them myself, in the hope of saving him. Oh, without the bargain. Oh, naturally, since I did not know what it was. And the explanation was still, presumably, unconvincing to you when you gave it. I was beginning to waver. So you were able to tell them that it had convinced you. Oh, I could not quite say that. How many men precisely took part in shooting Monsieur de la Rochetterie? How many shots were fired? De Fresne looked harassed. Once more, Aymar came to his assistance. As Monsieur de Fresne was trying, at considerable risk, to cut me free, and had also to rally the men against the Bonapartists, he can hardly have been engaged in computation. I can satisfy the court up to a point. I was fired at twice by Le Bihan. His first shot struck me, and the second missed and by another man who also hit me, and by at least one more, as I afterwards discovered. That makes a minimum of three men and four shots. There may have been more. I do not know, because I lost consciousness after the second. But I imagine that they had not much more leisure. He sat down again. It was beyond Laurent how he could have steeled himself to get up. Sol de Grisol, intervening here, observed. Well, I think we can now leave this part of the subject. It is obvious that hasty shots by three or four men cannot be said to constitute an execution. But the stout officer said stubbornly, oh, Yes, General, but if he was fastened to a tree, the intention at least of an execution seems obvious. And since it was nothing short of murder of a commanding officer, I cannot believe that even irregular troops would be guilty of such an unprecedented act without more reason than the showing of this letter. And, by the way, who destroyed that letter, and why? I destroyed it, replied de Fresne briefly, and I did so because I believed Monsieur de la Rochetterie to have died in the hands of the enemy, and I saw no purpose to be served by keeping a piece of evidence which he was not alive to refute. In fact, put in Fouquier Timville, you tried to hush up the whole matter, was it for the same reason that you never attempted to have any of these men brought to justice? Did you continue to command them, by the way? What happened to them? 
de Fresne told him. Then you took no steps to have even Lubihan brought to trial. You preferred the matter to go by default, even when these rumours began to get about, rather than give the men a chance of stating their case. In fact, you acted then just as Monsieur de la Gorgeterie is acting now, either from design or carelessness, keeping out the men's evidence. I protest against that inference, said de Fresne angrily, both for myself and Monsieur de la Gorgeterie. Monsieur le Président. Yes, I think it is quite unfounded. Sol de Rissol looked at Fouquier Tinville. Then I withdraw it, said the latter. But I do submit that, either in those three days in the wood, or in the destroyed letter, there was some more damning proof of treachery than appears. Aymar was on his feet in an instant. How will you stand down, Monsieur de Fresne? I call Colonel Richard as a witness that there was nothing extraneous in the letter but my deciphering of a portion of it and his subsequent endorsement. And there was nothing more, not a syllable, said the imperialist. Then it was the unaccounted for three days, pronounced the stout officer. Aymar drew himself up. His temper was roused, but no one save Laurent would have known it. I can only assure the court once more, he said, that nothing was further from my thoughts than to keep back any evidence. But the court must admit that I could hardly have induced any of the men who shot me to come willingly before this tribunal and confess to what has already been qualified as murder, and whether justifiable or no. The president nodded, as if in appreciation of this point, and the Marquis de Boissière, addressing him, remarked, it scarcely seems to me, Monsieur le Président, that we need distress ourselves over the supposition that adverse evidence is being suppressed. What is far more serious, in my view, is of quite an opposite nature. Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's entire failure to bring conclusive testimony to support his main contention. We may believe that he is speaking the truth when he says that he acted in good faith, but not because he has proved that he did. If I may put it rather harshly, and there has not this afternoon been one shred of real evidence to prove that he did not deliberately sacrifice his troops to save his cousin. If a mag did not flush, Laurent did. He almost ground his teeth. Oh, I think, Monsieur de la Boissière, said the President, that that undoubtedly is to put it rather harshly. We must hope that Monsieur de la Gorgeterie can bring some more convincing testimony on that point tomorrow, since I think we must now adjourn for today. End of section twenty eight. Section twenty nine of the Wounded Name by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Eileen. Chapter 9, Part 4 6 All the way back to Aymar's lodging, those words were vibrating through Laurent's whole being. Not a shred of real evidence to show that he did not deliberately sacrifice his men to save his cousin. Yet when they got into the little room, and de Fresne, who had accompanied them, revealed the depth of his gloom and of his irritation, Laurent, from pure antagonism, and began to tear up. I told you so, lamented the poor gentleman. I told you so from the beginning, La Rochetterie, that it was a mistake to court inquiry now, and after failing to produce your two chief witnesses, still more so. And what is going to happen tomorrow? We have no more evidence. The thing will become a farce. Oh, I will tell you what will happen tomorrow, monsieur, remarked Laurent rather maliciously. You will go on giving your testimony, perhaps for hours, with that fat old fellow asking question after question about those three days in the Bois de Fauvette, which intrigue him so, the three days of creation. Aymar, who looked like a ghost, smiled in spite of himself. That event occupied six, you will remember, Laurent. And the unfortunate de Fresne said tartly that, with such a prospect in front of him, he would betake himself to his inn and go to bed early. As he closed the door behind his lieutenant, Aymar shook his head at the tormentor. 
You are really rather unkind, Laurent. And, as Laurent made a grimace intended to show at once a sense of self-justification and a measure of penitence, he went on gravely. And, you know, mon ami, and de Fresne is quite justified in his view. I have not really any chance, now, of being cleared, that is. Indeed, I was very strongly tempted to tell the general, at the close of today's proceedings, and that it was hardly worth while wasting the time of the court any more. But then it came to me that perhaps it was cowardly, and perhaps it was rash. And I've had enough of being both. Oh, the first you have never been, retorted Laurent. Moreover, I feel that the luck will turn, yet. Oh, remember that you have the Chatelier back. Now, you're tired to death. Lie down on this horrible sofa and try to rest a little. No, you do not need to go through those notes any more. Oh, that is true, agreed Aimag as he obeyed him. And there's nothing more to say now. And as Logon spread a covering over him, he added, with a smile, But I did not mean you to come here to begin Act Belle over again. What did you mean me to come for, then, since you will not let me give evidence, now that I am here? Aimag made no reply in words. He merely pressed his hand. And a few minutes later, sheer fatigue overriding the nervous tension, he was sleeping like a child. But in spite of his own brave words, Laurent's heart ached as he sat beside him and thought of the morrow. And today? In some ways, Aimard had got through better than he probably looked for. In the matter of keeping out Madame de Villecresne's name, for instance. On the other hand, and they neither of them anticipated that the court would want to burrow so deeply into that intensely painful episode of the shooting. What would be the outcome of the whole business? What, indeed, would an impartial observer have said was the real outcome of today's proceedings? But in Madame Leblanc's little sitting room, no such person existed, and there was only one very anxious young man watching another. More than half an hour had passed thus when there came a knock at the door, and Laurent, tiptoeing over, was presented by Madame Leblanc with a large visiting card and the information that there was a gentleman downstairs asking to see Monsieur de la Gauchetterie. Laurent gave an exclamation. What is it? asked Aimard, rousing. You would never guess, cried Laurent, in high glee. Our dear Père Perelet had come, I'm sure, to make amends, and though dropped from heaven knows where, and on your track heaven knows how. Oh, you'll see him, eh, Mag, of course. And, pelting down the narrow stairs, he almost fell into the arms of Monsieur le Docteur, Je M. P. Perelet, in all his Sunday clothes, at the bottom. Indeed, Monsieur le Docteur soundly embraced him. Oh, my dear boy, how is he after this morning? I was there, or you didn't see me. Oh, I managed to get in. I, as a military doctor... I heard of this by chance at Arbel two days ago, so I knew that I should find him here. And now I've listened to it all. Oh, mon Dieu, what a story! Oh, what a brute and fool I was! Oh, will he see me? I want to ask his pardon. And do you think he will give it me? Or perhaps he never realized that... Oh, did he not, returned Laurent. But he owes you far too much to refuse it. And in any case... I'll go up, and there's the door. And he watched the little doctor mount the stairs, already taking out his pocket handkerchief, heard him open the door, and say in husky tones, Oh, my dearest boy, can you ever? And then the door shut. Oh, well, thought the young man, leaning against the foot of the stairs and feeling a kind of pleasant moisture about his own eyelids. Oh, at least I have never claimed not to be a sentimentalist. Oh, how long shall I give them? Monsieur Pigalet stayed to supper, which his presence somehow enlivened into quite a cheerful meal. He was very hopeful, on what grounds could hardly be discovered. I wonder, thought Laurent once more, and that he doesn't say, I'm no optimist, and shortly afterwards, to his delight, 
the old surgeon did remark. Well, of course, I'm not one to take an unduly rosy view of things. And Logon himself again besought Aymar to call him as a witness, and when Aymar inquired, as a witness to what, asseverated anew that he should not be contented till Du Tremblay knew what he owed him over the cipher business, until they all knew it. My dear Logon, observed Loiseleur a little dryly, you surely do not expect me to bring it forward as a merit that I did not betray a comrade's plans when it was suggested to me to do so. Of course, he would never have done it voluntarily. But I wonder how many people, in your condition, could to the very last have kept their heads sufficiently not to show so much as assent or dissent when that blackguard narrowed the issue down to a single question, and that vital question of the crossing of the river. And nobody who had not a will of steel pronounced M. Pegalet. How oh, there you are, cried Laurent. There is evidence, indirect, if you like, as to intention and character. Oh, I could make it very plain to those gentlemen if I had the chance. Aymar shrugged his shoulders. I am afraid your desire will not be gratified, mon cher, and I am afraid that I don't want it gratified so publicly. Oh, it's a great waste, sighed the champion stubbornly and it is of no good to depreciate testimony of that kind, because you see that it is without a shred of real evidence, as M. de la Boisillac would say, that you have converted, he grinned, a hard-headed, unemotional, scientific man like M. Pigolet from his temporary unbelief. 7. The scientific man in question becoming very high-handed after supper and ordering his ex-patient to bed, Laurent went forth to hunt up a couple of acquaintances whom he had seen as they came back from the Hôtel de Ville. He found them, as he expected, at the Hôtel de Cusson, and, knowing Aymar to be an excellent hands, went in with them and called for wine. In the room he entered, which was full of officers, the inquiry seemed to be the sole topic of conversation, and the only point on which there appeared to be general agreement was that those who had not attended it that afternoon, would be there next morning. Some stared at Laurent, recognizing him, and he felt that it was not a bad move to have put in an appearance, just to show that one had a clear conscience. His own friends were fortunately bien pensants, one of them enthusiastically so, and the other said that he thought La Gaucheterie must be innocent, or he would never have had the courage to bring all this upon himself. With them, too, Surmises were not wanting as to the cousin and her relations with Loiseleur, but Laurent purposely avoided throwing any light upon the subject. And presently, lo, through the clouds of tobacco smoke, a face appeared for a moment and vanished again. Laurent made one of his swift sallies. Oh, Monsieur Pegalet, come in, come in. Are you looking for me? How charming of you! Come and have a glass of wine with me. I've some friends here. You can tell us the latest news from Arbel. Monsieur Pegalet, chuckling, protesting and pleased, suffered the young man to drag him in and make presentations. Oh, well, yes, perhaps one glass of cognac, he said. I left him in bed, he announced, behind his hand to Laurent. In fact, I gave him a sleeping draught, and though he was not aware of it, and there's something I want to ask you, presently. Oh, thank you, monsieur, you're too kind. So there the good doctor sat, smoking a cheroot, and very happy in the consciousness that he was seeing life, in the royalist camp, this time. At least that was how Laurent read his amused and contented and observant expression, and he was probably not far wrong. But half of Laurent himself, and though he continued to chat, was gauging with a rather too acute sensitiveness the current of feeling in the room about the one thing which mattered to him. After the tension of the afternoon, the wine he had taken, and though without affecting his head in the ordinary sense, made him conscious of a desire to get up and say something, publicly, on a mark's behalf. But his better sense warned him against it. However, he ended by engaging in something a great deal more sensational than oratory. 
for at a table close by had now been sitting for a little while with a friend, the very officer whose behaviour had displeased them in the audience at the Hôtel de Ville. Logon could not help hearing their conversation. The two amused themselves for some time by half-whispered witticisms about La Belle Cousine, and though Logon's brow grew darker and darker, his good sense again warned him not to bring this topic into more prominence by taking notice of it. But suddenly he heard, so clearly spoken that others must have heard it, too. I'm pretty brazen, and to base your main defense on an invented conversation with two men, of whom one is dead and the other cannot be found. And the other man assented, and Laurent, angry as he was, realized what a specious appearance of truth there was in this criticism. And yet, went on the voice of his bête noire, in spite of the fact that he has not, as La Boisillac said, a shred of real evidence to bring forward, I am afraid that he will never get what he deserves now. No, responded the other. It is curious, the impression he seems to have made on some of the court. How can it, you see, and that it is this pose of complete honesty in telling the whole truth that is doing it? It was an idea little short of genius. Of course, one must be a good actor to carry it out. But that is just what the man is. Whatever is the matter, my dear boy, exclaimed Monsieur Pigalet. Oh, the dear boy did move sometimes, with such disconcerting suddenness. As for the individual who had so appraised Loiselag's histrionic abilities, he had now in front of him, to his exceeding surprise, a fair young man in the Vendean uniform, who was saying, with a very deadly intensity, And you will kindly take back every word of what you've just said, monsieur, and apologize for having said it. What? I'll be damned if I will cried the critic, jumping to his feet. So Logon, exclaiming, Espèce de guiton, knocked him down. Aha, la box anglaise, said Monsieur Perlet, craning forward like everyone else. But the combat was not destined to proceed on pugilistic lines. Amid terrific clamour, the victim rose to his feet, tugging at his sword, while some threw themselves on him, and Laurent's two friends tried to drag him away. Monsieur de Courtemag himself appeared quite calm, and though he was really tingling with the liveliest wrath. His satisfaction was oh, certainly, Monsieur Perlet heard him say, amid the babel. Also instantly, Mon Brulet, you'll see fair play for me, won't you? Oh, but you can't fight here, several voices assured him, and his friends, too, spoke of next morning. I regret that I am engaged tomorrow morning, quoth Lohum, and proceeded to remove his sword belt. Lucky I had my sword on this time, he told himself. Engaged? Ah, yes, with a play actor, sneered his opponent, whose lip was already swelling. No, retorted Lohum, throwing back his head and speaking very clearly and deliberately. With my friend, Monsieur le Vicomte de la Gorgeterie, un chevalier de Saint-Louis. He who held the moulin brûlé, Loiselag. How oh, bravo! cried several voices to this. And I will either give you satisfaction here and now, or not at all, resumed Laurent. You need have no fear on the score of the medical attendants. I have an excellent surgeon with me. He slightly indicated Monsieur Perlet. And though he, too, happens to be a friend of Monsieur de la Gauche de Guise, I'm sure he will do his best for you. And there were not only cheers, but laughter now. The general opinion also was with Laurent on the desirability of settling the affair on the spot, and his foe was too angry to wish to postpone shedding his blood. So the company pushed back the tables with alacrity, and Laurent stripped off his coat and gave it to one of his friends. At that point, Monsieur Perlet came and caught him by the arm. Laurent, he said in a low voice, agitated, and yet pleasurably agitated, and unaware that he had used his Christian name. Oh, Logon, my dear boy, are you au fait at this sort of thing? And do you mean, inquired Logon coolly, as he rolled up his shirt-sleeve, have I ever fought before? No, I've not. But between foils and single-stick, I know quite enough to settle Monsieur Guiton Cadet. Monsieur Pegolet could not restrain a chuckle of appreciation. 
but he whispered, "'How oh, do, pray, be careful.' "'How oh, of him? Oh, yes, up to a point.' How all too short are moments of ecstasy. This one only lasted, from the on guard and the loosing of the crossed blades, fifty-six seconds exactly, seconds in which the younger gentleman at the end of one of those blades was blissfully unimaginably happy. He knew that he was no brilliant swordsman, but he knew, too, that he had a steady hand, a quick eye, and a very good balance, and he was fighting for a mag. Yes, it was a pity that this man, ten years his senior and with more experience, no doubt, behind him, was so angry, and because otherwise he might have prolonged the bout instead of exposing himself in that crazy fashion. A queer sensation, and that, of the point going in. A queer, evidently, for Guiton Cadet also. And there was surprise on his face, as well as pain and fury, as he recoiled, run very creditably through the top of the right shoulder. Eight. About a quarter of an hour afterwards, Laurent found himself arm in arm under the stars with Monsieur Perlet, his purpose being to escort that excellent gentleman back to his inn. Prudence had dictated to all in the coffee room of the Hôtel de Cusson, who were amenable to military discipline, a quiet and speedy dispersal, and Laurent himself had only waited till Monsieur Perlet had finished with his victim. The wound was not dangerous, but it was painful on hearing which its author had expressed the most unchivalrous gratification. And the couple were now in unfeelingly good spirits, as they picked their way in the darkness over gutters. "'I wish I could scold you, as you deserve to be scolded, un mauvais sujet,' said Monsieur Perlet, impressing the arm under his. Oh, "'But I am incapable of it, and it was so neat, so clever, even, considering that you can know nothing of anatomy.' and your success, your championship of La Gauchetique, had an extraordinary effect. I felt it. How oh, do you really think so? asked Laurent, soaring into a still higher heaven. Oh, I am sure of it. It was almost a pity that none of the... <laughs> that none of the nine muses were there, finished the young man, laughing. Yes, that is my pretty name for the gentlemen of the court of inquiry. But, on the whole... It's a good thing they were not. And by the way, Monsieur Perlet, did you ever get that letter I wrote you? Monsieur Perlet stopped on the brink of a dark streamlet. Oh, I did, my child, and thankful I was to get it, though it made me more than ever distressed and ashamed about that incident at La Boussin. Oh, but what he said that night was really most damning. No, I shall not tell you what it was. Still, I shall never forgive myself for acting as I did. And how much more trying that shooting business, too, must have been for the poor boy than I realized. Yes, said Lagon rather sadly. And the worst of it is that to have gone through all that suffering and shame only leaves him in a more critical position than he was before. You heard this afternoon how it was cast up against him and to what cruel allegations it led. As for tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow will be all right, you will see, announced Monsieur Perlet, resuming his advance. If he can hold out until the end, and that is. He is not really in the least fit for this affair, of course. Ah, this was what I wanted to ask you. Round this corner is my way. And what in the name of fortune made those marks on his arm, which he tried, too late, to conceal from me when I was examining him after you left? They are burns, and he says he did them himself by accident, and expects me, a doctor, to believe him. And this time it was Laurent who stopped, and under a convenient street lamp. Oh, he said that, did he? Oh, of course he would. Accident, indeed. He made one of his hot, boyish gestures. It was the most deliberate, cold-blooded. He never reached his noun. A gesture was made behind him. A hand fell on his shoulder. "'I regret to have to demand your sword, monsieur,' said an abrupt military voice. "'You are placed under arrest. Kindly follow me at once.' It is hard to know which of the couple was the more thunderstruck. Words were completely smitten from both of them. On the very threshold of his thrilling revelation, 
Laurent was plucked away, vanishing like a dream from the eyes of Monsieur Perrelet, who, a moment later, was left, a stout and bewildered little civilian, in the light of the convenient street lamp, while the footsteps of the patrol and the captured duelist died away round the corner. The thread of events lay thereafter in Monsieur Perrelet's hands. After a short period of dismayed reflection, he hurried back to Aymar's lodging. Oh, but that young man lay relaxed in the profound and beneficent slumber of his physician's own procuring, and it would have been a crime to wake him. So, except that the hazard of sleep afforded Monsieur Perrelet an uninterrupted view of the branded arm, he gained little by his visit and hastened off to M. de Fresne, conceiving that there was nothing criminal in waking him with the news. M. de Fresne was hardly of that opinion. By the time his nocturnal caller had introduced himself and explained his errand, he was, and perhaps justifiably, in a thoroughly bad temper. A poor boy indeed! A feather-brained young scamp! Let him cool his heels. It won't hurt him and I can do nothing, and the only possible course is for La Rochetterie, if he can, to get permission in the morning for him to attend the court under open arrest as a witness. How oh, a nice witness for a case where already the testimony is so short of the mark! Monsieur Pigalet shook his head at the irate gentleman sitting up in his bed. Oh, I consider that he acted very properly, monsieur. And as for being feather-brained, let me tell you, in all seriousness, and that but for him there would be no La Rochetterie here today at all. Ha, huh, said Monsieur de Fresne, and laying down, turned over on his other side. Well, I will come and see La Rochetterie about it at half past six. A oh, good night. A little before that hour, therefore, Monsieur Pigalet was on foot once more, and having obtained admission, peeped in on his patient and the russet head moved at once on the pillow. Oh, you're up early, Monsieur Pigalet. How oh, have you slept, my dear boy? inquired the doctor, coming in. I've not had a night like this, replied Aymar, for weeks. Oh, it is fortunate, but mysterious. Oh, why, is that de Fresne up early, too? Monsieur Pigalet glanced behind him. Oh, Monsieur de Fresne wants you to write a letter for him to take to the general, he observed casually. And just a line, and to request formally that one of your witnesses may be released from arrest in order to attend the court this morning. Oh, one of my witnesses arrested, exclaimed Aymar, raising himself on an elbow. Oh, you don't mean to say that they've arrested Colonel Richard. His coming here was all arranged with the general-in-chief. Oh, no, not Richard. I'm glad to say, replied his lieutenant. But your friend, Monsieur de Courtemag, made the devil of a disturbance in my hotel last night, and he's now in custody. Laurent, Laurent made a disturbance. Oh, I should rather say, and I was present, put in Monsieur Perrelet, and that he made an impression, and a very gallant one. But as he also made an incision in a member of the party. Oh, you mean he fought someone? exclaimed a mag, starting up in bed. Oh, and in my quarrel, oh, I can guess it. Oh, my God, he's not hurt. Oh, don't tell me he's hurt, he cried, clutching hold of Monsieur Pigalet. No, my dear boy, he's not. He had not a scratch. It is the other who is hors de combat, and he's not seriously damaged, either. But Laurent is laid by the heels. I do not even know where it happened so suddenly in the street, as we were coming home. De Fresne, meanwhile, had got paper and ink and brought them to the bedside. Oh, why did you not wake me last night? And cried a mag, seizing them. Oh, he's been a whole night, then, under arrest, in discomfort and anxiety. 9. Laurent, indeed, had been in both, to a high degree, in the cell of the disused convent to which he had been conducted. The discomfort, the fact of arrest itself, could have been light payment for his moment exquis. In other circumstances, but in these, his loss of liberty was calamitous. His evidence, that precious evidence, and to the hope of giving which he still clung, 
his presence itself in the court next morning at the verdict, all hung by a hair. He tried to bribe the sentries. He cast wildly about for means of escape. Till it came to him crushingly, and that even if he did escape, he could not present himself in court without being instantly re-arrested, and damaging a mag. It was, therefore, and to a very subdued and unaffervescent young man that it was announced, about eight in the morning, that he could regard himself as under open arrest for the day in order to attend the court of inquiry. He walked out, dazed but thankful, to find M. de Fresnet waiting for him in the street. "'How oh, I owe this to you, then, monsieur,' he exclaimed gratefully. "'How good of you! How you cannot realize what it means to me!' You owe it to Monsieur de la Rocheterie, responded de Fresne with no grace of manner. He had to be roused from sleep early this morning to request your release. I could not have done anything. Nor, his tone added, should I have done anything if I could. Logon hung his head. Well, continued de Fresne, surveying him, if you're going into court, you had better come back with me to my hotel and make yourself a little more presentable. Oh, I can go to my room at Madame Le Blanc's, said Laurent meekly. Oh, I suppose I do look rather disreputable, he added, trying to laugh as they turned together along the street. But as they walked, de Fresne was sufficiently human and unwise to try to improve the occasion a little further. Oh, I cannot help wondering, Monsieur de Courtemac, he remarked, what benefit you imagined you were doing La Rocheterie, and by running the risk of being brought back last night to his lodging on a shutter, as you might so easily have been. Laurent was silent. Nor, pursued the elder man, what support you fancied you were giving to his cause by brawling. Obviously it can have done it nothing but harm. Oh, there you are wrong, replied Laurent rather shortly. Ask Monsieur Pigalet. Oh, I'm astonished that Monsieur Pigalet did not use his influence to prevent the disturbance. No, oh, he didn't want to, replied the duelist. He enjoyed it, oh, nearly as much as I did. He sighed reminiscently, almost tenderly. And now, continued his mentor, disregarding this, if you do give evidence on any point, everybody in court will see that you are without your sword. Oh, but so I was yesterday. You did not notice that. No, you were rather occupied yourself. And de Fresne glanced sharply at him. And they were nearly at the hotel by now. I am older than you, Monsieur de Courtemar, and therefore I permit myself to regret that you did not think more carefully of the consequences of your behavior to other people, and to one person in particular. And there was now a wicked light in Laurent's eyes. Oh, I am so sorry, he exclaimed, with what sounded the most genuine regret in his voice. Oh, you mean that you were waked up over the scandalous escapade of mine? Oh, I had not realized that. Oh, do, monsieur, receive my most profound apologies. Ha, huh, said the Fresne angrily. And they had stopped at the entry of the hotel, scene of last night's drama. Oh, you know I mean La Rochetterie, whom you might have spared an added anxiety. Oh, but it is so hard, said the young man gently, his eyes on the cobblestones. So hard to know beforehand the consequences of an action, even of an entirely justifiable action like mine. For instance, even you yourself, Monsieur de Fresne, must have felt sometimes that if you had not brought back that letter of yours to the Bois de Fauvette. He stopped, raised his eyes, and saw from de Fresne's face that he had planted his counter-thrust almost too well. And the elder man turned his back and disappeared without a word into the hotel. Oh, well, he should not have lectured me, thought Laurent rather uncomfortably as he sped to Madame Le Blanc's. And he burst in upon Aimard, who was finishing his breakfast, and crying, A return of the prodigal who badly needs a wash. Oh, mon cher, I am at least a penitent prodigal. I am, indeed. Oh, but are you really an unhurt one? asked Aimard, springing up and seizing him. Oh, Monsieur Pigalet swears it, but... Oh, but you think that I, too, might have been hiding an injury from him and telling him a cock-and-bull story about it. 
No, Aymar, he added more seriously. I've not received. How I could wish I had. And the poorest equivalent of what you carry for me. On the contrary, I hear that you had to be waked up this morning on my account, a wretch that I am. Who told you that, Laurent? I was already awake, after a night and a thousand. But a little later, when having washed and shaved, and the prodigal was eating, Aymar said in a low voice, How oh, you understand me, when I say I hope it was for me that you fought, Laurent. Not that I wish a hundred times you had not exposed yourself in a quarrel that was not worth it. But it was my quarrel, was it not? I dared not ask Monsieur Perrelet. How entirely and absolutely your quarrel, replied Laurent, looking him in the face and thanking his stars that he had not taken any notice of the remarks about Madame de Villecresne. And mine, he added, finishing his coffee. Aymar had laid his watch on the table. He pointed to it now and got up. No time to start. What is odd to think, isn't it, that when the hour hand gets around to the spot again, it will all be over. Logon fixed his eyes on the watch, suddenly miserable and afraid. How oh, they can't proclaim you guilty, Aymar. Oh, they won't proclaim me innocent. It will just be not proven. I do not know whether they will deprive me of my commission, but I shall resign it, of course. Oh, but there is your reputation, and there is the Moulin Brûlé, and all the rest. And nobody is concerned with my reputation of last year, Laurent. Oh, that's just it, cried Laurent angrily. Oh, if only I were defending you. And why is no one defending you, so that he could bring it forward, and since you are so damnably proud that you will not do it yourself? All the time yesterday, one could watch points that ought to have been made in your favour, going unheeded, just because to emphasise them involved a little blowing of your own trumpet. And I suppose it will be the same today. Others may think it modesty, and perhaps you think so yourself, but I tell you it is pride, rank, ineradicable pride. You are as proud as Lucifer. After which outburst, almost in tears, he put his head down on his arms on the breakfast table. Aymar stood and looked at him. Oh, I did not know you had such powers of denunciation, Laurent. Oh, it is of no use denouncing you, said the muffled voice. You will not do any differently. He lifted his head. And the only thing that would be of the slightest benefit today would be for me to change, and to become, if only I could, sent at Yen for an hour. How do you think I want you changed, even for poor Saint Etienne? asked Aymar gently, laying a hand on his shoulder. Oh, I don't want you to be anybody but yourself, Laurent. Oh, come, we must start. You have no need to pretend to forget your sword today, my poor knight errand. End of section twenty nine. Section 30 of The Wounded Name by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Eileen. Chapter 9, Part 5. 10. Just outside the Hotel de Ville, Le Consent de Fresne, he went straight up to him. I want to beg your pardon, Monsieur de Fresne, for what I said to you a little while ago about that letter. It was cruel and unjust. De Fresne looked at him with those hard blue eyes of his. Oh, it was certainly cruel. And do you think I've never said that same thing to myself in these three months? He began to pale under his tan. I've said it a hundred times. But, as you pointed out... Oh, I am sorry, broke in Laurent impulsively. And, in honour, you could have done nothing else. Oh, do forget it. I was annoyed when I spoke. I think you had cause, said the elder man suddenly. I had no right to read you a homily. He held out his hand. And then Laurent was back in the place which would shortly see the scales dip to one side or the other, with his dearest friend's honour in the balance. And the place which he hated 
and which, at the same time, he was only too thankful to set eyes on again, for he had had a horrible fright. But a precious grain of consolation was that among the more than doubled number of faces in the audience this morning, one was missing. It would grin here no more, and was almost certainly not grinning where it was now. And the president began by saying that he had an announcement to make. Since Monsieur le Général Dondigny, now military governor of maine et loire was staying a couple of nights in the neighborhood, he himself had so far presumed on their very old acquaintance as to ask him, with the approval of the court, to give them the benefit of his ripe experience in this difficult and delicate case. And that was, subject to Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's having no objection. Monsieur de la Gauchetterie here signifying that he had none, on the contrary. Sol de Guisol intimated that he had sent Monsieur Dondigny a short summary of the case, as far as it had gone yesterday, so that if he came, he would be au courant. Meanwhile, and they had better proceed from the point at which they left off yesterday. And so the hapless de Fresne took his stand once more at the witness table. Laurent tried not to listen. Fouquier, Tinville, and the stout officer between them seemed determined to probe into every minute of the interval before de Fresne's return to the wood. Hence, Aymar also was on his feet most of the time. Laurent began to foresee that every detail of the shooting, too, would have to be gone over again, and perhaps more fully. And all to what purpose? There was nothing to discover. What would happen if they could not see their way to clearing a mar? It began to be torture to him to look at the figure in front of him, especially when the bronze head turned a little, and he caught the outline of the sunken cheek. Oh, I can't stand much more of this, he whispered at last to Monsieur Pigalet. Well, they will not go on at it for ever, the optimist whispered back, and he laid his hand over the young man's and gave it a squeeze. Oh, but there's nothing else to go on to, replied Laurent miserably. Oh, why could they not believe Aymar's word when he said that he had all but arranged the plan with saint Etienne? How was it possible to look at him and think him capable of infamy? And were they all blind? And why did Monsieur Dondigny delay? Or perhaps he was not coming, after all. He was a great man, and just about to be made a peer of France, and very busy at the moment settling the king's peace in Brittany. But if he did come, surely he, the Vendean general of so much experience, he, the phenomenally cool-headed and resourceful, the hero of the incredible escapes from the Fort de Joux, and the citadel of Besançon, and the man of untarnished integrity and honour, he would recognise that a mag was telling the truth. Or suppose that he did not. And the accursed stout officer seemed now to be criticising a mag's intentions and dispositions, and during those three days in the wood, and as it went on, Laurent wondered at a mag's patience under it. The inquisitor had just ascertained that the nearest Bonapartist troops were no more than eight miles away, at Arbel. Only eight miles, he exclaimed. I am surprised, Monsieur de la Gauchetterie, and that you did not try to withdraw to a safer position. Surely, you must have known that you were very dangerously placed, and that you could not hope to do anything there with ninety men. And a man said nothing. Suddenly, Monsieur de Tremblay leaned forward and addressed the speaker. Not do anything with ninety men, Monsieur de Noirlieu. Why not? Have you forgotten that Monsieur de la Gauchetterie held the famous Moulin Brulee for four and a half hours against five hundred regulars? With how many men precisely had you with you at Penescoué, Monsieur de la Gauchetterie? Eighteen, replied a mag. Something hardly distinguishable from applause ran round the audience. And Du Tremblay went on quickly, addressing the president. I trust, mon général, that I am in order in laying stress on the necessity of remembering and allowing weight unto those brilliant services in the past, of which Monsieur de la Rochetterie himself is careful not to remind us. As regards the handling of irregular levies, has not Loiseleur, young as he is, had more experience and successful experience 
and than anyone here except yourself. Sol de Grisol nodded, and the Marquis de la Boisillère remarked, Oh, certainly more than I have had. I'm glad that you said what you said, Monsieur du Tremblay. So was Logon. He would have bestowed a decoration on Monsieur du Tremblay. Yes, said Monsieur de Noirlier obstinately, and that past experience is just why Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's remaining so near the enemy at Arbel is so inexplicable. Oh, there was nothing to be done with that man but drown him. Surely, Aimard was going to give the very good reason he had for staying in the Bois de Fauvet as long as he could. But in any case he had not the chance, for Fouquier Tinville observed quickly, Oh, it is explicable enough on a certain hypothesis, which I do not wish to press. But I should be greatly obliged if Monsieur de la Rochetterie would give us the reason for another delay of his, which also needs explanation. I only trust they are not susceptible of the same. Aimard's head went up. And to what delay are you referring, monsieur? And to the very considerable one, which you have shown in courting this inquiry. You were released on the 16th of June. Even if your health was not then sufficiently re-established for you to go to the general-in-chief in person, why did you not at least communicate with him, if, as you assure us, you were so anxious to clear yourself. You made no move whatever for a month until the middle of July. Is that not true? Yes, it is quite true, said Aimard steadily. He drew a long breath, and Logon saw his fingers tighten on the paper he was holding. I suggest that the months in action, and then, need some justification, observed Fouquier Tinville suavely. In the silence that followed, Logon said to himself, Oh, he was ill, unfit for it, you bully. But would Aimard say that, since it was not the real reason? No, of course he would not. He replied at last, very coldly and quietly, looking down a little. The reason for the delay was a purely private one. A reason that you would prefer not to give the court suggested Fouquier Tinville with a twist of his lips. A reason, retorted Aimard, not without a measure of defiance, and that I am not called upon to give the court. At last something had been found which Loiselard would not answer. Oh, it had nothing in common, then, demanded the Inquisitor meaningly, with your reason for remaining so near the enemy in the Bois de Fauvet. Aimard started. Oh, certainly not. And the one was purely military, and the other, as I've said, was personal. And you refused to... But a stir arose at the end of the hall, and he broke off. Logon turned his head and saw a glitter of staff uniforms. General Dondigny had come. He walked alertly to the dais, while the whole audience rose to their feet. He saluted the court, who had also risen, was on the platform shaking hands, and, in a very short time indeed, having swept a keen glance round, was reading the notes of the morning's proceedings. And Logon, studying him, saw a blue-eyed man in the fifties, of no great height, with a fine, almost leonine head, from his brow the silvering fair hair was receding, and a slightly prominent underlip, a man who gave the impression of exceptional humor and vitality, allied to a rare imperturbability, but Laurent's deep interest in him was abruptly diverted. What had happened to Aimard? He was leaning with both hands on the little table before him, almost as if he were physically overcome. And then he suddenly sat down, and supporting his head on his hand, pulled his notes towards him. Laurent could see how deadly pale he was, and that the hand with which he was turning over the papers was shaking. Oh, it's the strain he thought desperately. It's telling at last. He won't get through. Dondigny suddenly raised his fine head. Monsieur le Président, I should like to make a remark. With regard to the suppositions raised by the shooting, surely, and the very fact that the men immediately suspected Monsieur de Fresne on his return, entirely disposes of the theory, and that, in the three preceding days, and they had discovered some proof of Monsieur de la Rochetterie's guilt. I might go further, 
and point out that it was solely to save M. de Fresne from those unjust suspicions that M. de la Rochetterie showed his men the letter, with the consequences to himself of which we know. Was that not so? And that is most certainly so, mon général, responded de Fresne warmly. M. de la Rochetterie undoubtedly sacrificed himself to save me. But, in the circumstances, could any honourable man have done less? inquired M. de Magadel. No, he certainly could not, responded Don Digny, like a flash. But then, you are trying to show that he is not an honourable man. And may I not also point out that, so far from his suppressing witnesses, which I see that some of you gentlemen are inclined to suspect, he here lost an unrivalled opportunity of allowing the most formidable witness against him to be suppressed by other hands. Had he let things take their course, and allowed M. de Fresne to be shot instead of him, which seems quite a likely thing to have happened, he would have got rid of the odium of the charge, as well as of an adverse witness, for the man who had paid the penalty would have carried the guilt also with him to his grave. His execution would probably have cleared M. de la Rochetterie in popular opinion. Oh, surely, these considerations must have occurred to you. Oh, I knew he would see things in a proper light, said Laurent, whose spirits had gone up like a balloon, and to M. Perlet, while the court conferred over this. And M. Dandigny, his chin propped on his fist, darted glance after glance at Loiselor's bent head. I think, announced the President at length, that the court does not wish to ask M. de Fresne any further questions. Have you any more witnesses to call, Monsieur de la Rochetterie? Yes, two, ejaculated Logan under his breath. And Aymar stood up, but it was not to call him. He threw back his head. I call Monsieur le Général Dandigny, he said in a clear voice. That is, if he has not forgotten, he finished a little breathlessly. Logan fell back in his chair. Amid the universal sensation, M. Dandigny got briskly to his feet. I was hoping that I should not have to be so pushing as to call myself, he remarked pleasantly. Will you question me, M. de la Rochetterie? I am entirely at your service. Or shall I have the honour of myself giving the court an account of our last, our first, meeting at the Abbey Dog at Caravan on the afternoon of April the 27th? The latter, if you please, General, answered A. Mag. 11. When Laurent was in an argumentative mood, he would assert that it was very wrong of M. Dandigny, even if he were organizing with great secrecy, not so much to have gone about under an assumed name, since under his own he would have been far too dangerous to be left at large, but to have kept up his incognito, in front of Loiselog that day at Caraven, when Saint Etienne, being from his own province of Anjou, knew all the time who Monsieur du Pac really was. However, he would acknowledge that on this occasion Monsieur Dandigny made what amends he could by the declaration with which he ended his short and convincing narrative. And for he said, with emphasis, that it was he who ought to be exculpating himself. I ought to have known better what attractions a risk holds for the young and ardent fighter when I presented M. de la Rochetterie with the idea of the mouse and the two cats, and even illustrated it from a little piece of good fortune of my own in the old days. Had I not been all these weeks, as you know, engaged in military operations elsewhere, I should have heard of Pont Rochet before, and I could have taken some steps to mitigate the terrible consequences which an ill-timed suggestion of mine has brought on a gallant and honourable man. I am at least thankful that fate has given me this belated opportunity for testimony. He sat down again. Aymar, his hands clenched, and tried to thank him, but his words were scarcely audible. As for Laurent, he was so radiant that it was all he could do to prevent himself darting forward to his friend, and, though he knew it not, Monsieur Dandigny, whom little escaped, who was smiling at his very patent exultation. Ah, well, gentlemen, said Sol de Guisol, looking round with a satisfied air, this puts a very different complexion on affairs. 
I little thought I was summoning the missing witness when I invited Monsieur Dordigny to attend as an assessor. As the court has felt all along, the great weakness of Monsieur de la Rochetterie's case has been the lack of conclusive evidence that his plan was already all but settled upon. But now we have impeccable testimony to this fact. He looked round the table once more. I suggest, therefore, yes, Monsieur de Noirlieu. In spite of what Monsieur le Général Dantigny has pointed out to us, said that persistent investigator, and there's still one more point which I emphatically feel should be cleared up. What happened after Monsieur de la Rochetterie was found shot in the... How many weeks was it that he was at the Chateau d'Arbel? Might it not be said that it was because he had rendered a great service to the imperialists and that they rescued him, nursed him, and released him of their own free will, and that he was, in short, less their prisoner than their guest? Locum, bristling, gave a kind of snort, and Aymar raised his head sharply. Don Digné's face was a study in expression, and the court themselves seemed a little taken aback, and then someone remarked, Yes, if any evidence is available, it might be as well to know what were Monsieur de la Rochetterie's relations with the imperialists during his captivity, and the reason for his release. Perhaps Monsieur de la Rochetterie will enlighten us, said Sol de Grisol. I can do better, mon général, responded Aymar rather grimly. As it happens, I can produce two witnesses as to the terms on which I was with the occupants of Arbel. I will call first Monsieur le Comte de Courtemar, late aide-de-camp to Monsieur Dantichamp, who was imprisoned in the same room with me for the whole time, excepting the first night. Monsieur de Courtemar, at last, had Laurent not been so furious with Monsieur de Noirlieu at that moment, he might have been grateful to him for procuring him this chance. But a mark a guest at Arbel. He could hear for once in his friend's voice his deep and justifiable indignation. But it was Monsieur de Noirlieu who was going to be annoyed before he, Laurent, had finished, for he would look the fool he was. He was excited, but fairly self-possessed, as he stood at the little table, and began with reasonable lucidity to tell the story of those weeks at Arbel. The early days came back to him so clearly as he spoke that, when he got to the happenings of Friday, and the memory of that scene, and bubbling up fresh like lava, led him into an account of it more vivid and than Aymar appeared to appreciate, as he sat there with his head between his fists, enduring it as best he might. At any rate, Logon made abundantly clear the point he had so desired at supper last night to emphasize, and that Aymar, fighting with his last conscious breath, and that nothing should escape his lips, had nearly given his life for his comrade's victory. Du Tremblay had his hand over his eyes, as Logon went on to testify that for the remaining weeks there were no relations whatever between the Bonapartists and their prisoner and to detail what occurred on Colonel Guiton's return. And that is how, and for what reason, he concluded, Monsieur de la Gauchetterie was released, or, as some might say, turned out, from Arbel. Oh, thank you, Monsieur de Courtemag, said the President out of the ensuing silence, and Logon turned and went to his place. He had not been asked a single question, and, as nobody seemed disposed to put one, Aymar observed that, since this evidence did not cover the first hours of his sojourn at Arbel, and it might be supposed that he had had friendly relations with the Bonapartists on the day of his arrival, if, on no other, he would call the doctor who attended him to prove that that was impossible. Monsieur Perellet, looking very rotund as he stood forth, was extremely businesslike and medical. He described in technical language Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's very critical condition when he was summoned to him, and during the whole of that first night, while Laurent behind whispered delightedly to de Fresne, oh, that will knock that idiot into a cocked hat. Listen to the long words and the Latin rolling out. My patient, pronounced the little doctor, was profoundly unconscious from the moment of his arrival. 
in any case, a man so near death as he, from hemorrhage, is not capable of having relations with anyone, friend or foe. And since I'm here, he went on, unasked, but unchecked, you will like to know, gentlemen, that I can more than corroborate what Monsieur de Cotomac had said of the disastrous effects of Colonel Guiton's inquisition a few days later. As to the turning out, which was done in my absence, I was thunderstruck when I heard of it, and not in the least surprised, and that in consequence I had to attend M. de la Gauchetterie for a threatened attack of pneumonia. He had a very narrow escape of it. Hardly the treatment, altogether, that one accords to a guest. M. de Noirlieu, to Laurent's joy, was looking sour enough now. He fidgeted with some papers for an instant, and then said, Yes, that's very convincing. Medically. One cannot argue with a doctor. You were not present, I understand, at the interview with the colonel over those cipher notes. No, but I came in the moment afterwards to find Monsieur de la Gauchetterie almost in extremis, replied Monsieur Perelet rather snappily. I should like Monsieur de Cotomac recalled, said Monsieur de Noirlieu. Logon came back full of fight, but wondering what the stout imbecile wanted now. Monsieur de la Gauchetterie was, I presume, aware of your presence in the room, Monsieur de Courtemag, throughout this unpleasant scene with the colonel. Oh, I should imagine he had something else to think about, retorted Laurent with hostility. In a flash he saw what he was after, and the man was a second Guiton. He must have known that you were present. Did you, Monsieur de la Gauchetterie? I did, said Aymar curtly. And you were aware that he was a royalist officer, one of your own side? I was aware of it. Monsieur de Noirlieu lifted his shoulders. Oh, I think, gentlemen, and that significant fact considerably detracts from the value of Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's refusal to give information. Viewed as evidence of character, and that is, is it likely that he would have given it in front of a fellow officer? May I speak, Monsieur le Président? burst out the witness. Sol de Grisol nodded. That, and that, he managed to swallow the qualification, point of view, was precisely Colonel Guiton's when he had failed. Oh, I should have thought that this court. Again he struggled with himself and abandoned the sentence. Gentlemen, as this last interpretation has been launched, you ought in justice to know that when, later on, Colonel Guiton, for it was by his connivance, retorted to other means to make Monsieur de la Gauchetterie betray a comrade, and there was nobody there but the... Aymar made a little gesture, and said in a low, quick voice, oh, For heaven's sake, stop, Laurent, and that is not relevant. But Laurent took no notice, and went on as fast as he could. He opposed precisely the same refusal to that different method. You see, mon général, I was safely hidden, but when the search party found Monsieur de la Gauchetterie ill at the farm, he was interrupted again. Uh, one moment, please, said the Marquis de la Boisillère. This is a little too elliptical for us to follow. Are we to understand that you were released at the same time as Monsieur de la Gauchetterie, or what? And Aymar seized the opportunity to rise and say with authority, oh, That will do, and thank you, Monsieur de Courtemar. We need not trouble the court with totally irrelevant matter. How you can stand down. But a distinct murmur of, no, no, went round. Laurent glanced at Aymar. He meant what he said, no doubt of it. Then he hesitated and looked at the tribunal. Oh, but we should like to hear it, irrelevant or no, said the president. Aymar was obliged to give in. He sat down. Laurent did not look at him. He answered the previous question. No, I was not released, sir. I escaped the same evening and joined Monsieur de la Gauchetterie. We went to a farm, and, as you have heard, he was ill from the exposure, and it was then that a party from the chateau came to search for me, and when they could not find me, but had Monsieur de la Gauchetterie at their mercy, alone, and they tried just as vainly to make him betray me, by... 
But here Laurent came to an abrupt stop. Well, Monsieur de Courtemac, asked the President after a moment. Awful and surprising finish. Laurent had so ached to tell the story of heroism and endurance, and now he could not. His own sensations of the time came back too vividly and closed up his throat and precluding speech. Besides, his tongue could not seem able to find a way of uttering the thing. He stood there, mute and agonized, with everyone, save a mag, gazing at him. Do you mean that they threatened him? suggested the Marquis de la Boisillac. And as the hitherto voluble witness shook his head, he said, almost impatiently, How what were the means they used, then? At that Laurent managed, but only just, and to bring it out. And they used a red hot ramrod, he gasped, and fled the table. End of section thirty. Section 31 of The Wounded Name by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Eileen. Chapter 9, Part 6. 12. There was an instant's electric silence. What? exclaimed several incredulous and horrified voices from the dais, Monsieur Dondignis among them. Oh, good God! said the Marquis de la Boissillac slowly. But Laurent, without waiting for permission, was already back in his place, his elbows on his knees, his head between his fists, heedless of what, under cover of the general sensation, Monsieur Pigalet on the one side was disjointedly asking him, and of de Fresnet swearing below his breath on the other. How ought I to have done it? Ought I to have done it? he was saying to himself. And will he forgive me? And all through the low-voiced conference among the court which followed, and the subdued hum of the audience, he was more and more conscious, and though he dared only glance at it, of the back of that figure in front of him. At first a mag had covered his face. How suppose he did not forgive him? Here was Saul de Gisol getting to his feet at last. I think, gentlemen, that we do not need any more testimony as to Monsieur de la Gaucheterie's conduct after the disaster, and as we now have Monsieur Dondigny's evidence as to the bona fides of the scheme he used, the case is practically at an end. None of the court has any further questions to ask, since we do not propose to inquire into this last shocking episode. Have you yourself, Monsieur de la Gaucheterie, anything more that you wish to say? Aimag lifted his head from his hand and stood up. Oh, nothing, thank you, mon général. And then I declare the case closed, and I will ask all present to withdraw while the court deliberates. They followed the orderly to a little room, opening off the hall. Directly the door was closed, Colonel Richard went up to Aimag. Oh, I'm more horrified than I can say at hearing of your treatment at Agbel, he said, in a voice which indeed showed his strong emotion. And as for this last outrage, the torture, I have no words for it. Aimag flushed. Oh, that was nothing, and I had no intention whatever of having it brought out in court. I never dreamt of such a thing. Laurent could not bear the sensation of estrangement, and at this juncture, too, a moment longer, he turned round, a mag, he began imploringly. But the imperialist had not finished. I have been deeply shocked, also to hear in detail what my own action led to. Had I not surrendered that letter? And if I, still more, had not taken it back to the wood, put in de Fresne. Gentlemen, said Monsieur Perelet, also intervening, and plucking the last two speakers by the arm. I think that if Monsieur de la Gauchetegui, you will remember that he has been very ill, were to sit down quietly now. Of course, said Colonel Richard instantly, and he and de Fresne withdrew themselves, while Monsieur Pigolet shepherded his ex-patient to a bench in the corner, and sat down in silence beside him, with a hand on his wrist. Near Lecon, Colonel Richard and de Fresne 
were now commenting optimistically on Don Digny's extraordinarily opportune appearance. But Laurent had no eyes for anyone save Aymar, sitting there silent with closed eyes, his head against the wall. His face was like a cameo, as drained of color and as passionless, too. He gave the impression of having passed beyond suspense, but of being nearly slain with fatigue. But as the offender miserably studied him, the closed eyes opened. Aymar looked across at him and smiled. Then he made a little motion with his other hand. Laurent went, hesitatingly, and sat down by him, and the guardian on the other side not attempting to say him nay. And though Aymar did not stir and had shut his eyes again, the hand which had beckoned Laurent there closed on his. He was forgiven, without a word. And in the odd silence which now fell on all of them, he, holding that hand, had to force himself to realize that this was the crisis, the dividing line, and that a mag's whole future hung on what those men in there. How could he so flippantly have called them the nine muses? Were deciding. They could not now find him guilty after Monsieur Dondigny's evidence. But suppose they were not sufficiently agreed and to acquit him. And there was Fouquier Tinville and that stubborn de Noirieux. Oh, that was inconceivable. A fit of bitter revolt seized him. Why had Aymar submitted himself into their hands, as if their opinion mattered? Oh, but it did matter now. Involuntarily, he clutched the cold hand tighter. De Fresne had begun to walk nervously up and down, but Colonel Richard was still leaning against the wall with his arms folded. The doctor was watching a mag attentively. Steps outside, the orderly at last. There was nothing to be learnt from his face. If you will come back now, gentlemen. Their hands fell apart. Aymar got up instantly. Without a look, even at Laurent, he walked to the door, and the others followed him in silence. It came to Laurent as they went through that by the position of the sword on the table they would know his fate. So, not very sensibly, he shut his eyes for a second. Then the blood rushed to his head. The hilt of a mag's sword was towards him. Somehow he was back in his place, standing as they all were, his attention divided between the president risen to address the acquitted and a mag's motionless figure in front of him. Why had the old Chouan put on spectacles to deliver judgment, since he was looking over, not through them? His voice came, relieved and kindly. I have great pleasure in announcing to you, Monsieur de la Gaucheteque, and that the court unanimously finds you innocent of the slightest intention of treachery when you sent your subordinate's letter to the imperialists, and holds that you had sufficient grounds for considering your preconceived plan feasible. It does not, therefore, blame you, in the exceptional circumstances, for attempting to carry it out. For your efforts to prevent the disaster, and your whole conduct afterwards, we have nothing but praise, and not least for your courage in voluntarily submitting to a very painful ordeal. And, if you will come forward, monsieur, I shall most gladly restore to you your sword, untarnished. There was an uncontrollable burst of applause from the audience, through which Laurent heard Monsieur Perelet beside him sniffing audibly. Aymar moved, took two steps forward, and then put his hand to his head and hesitated. Laurent was conscious of a violent nudge from Monsieur Perelet and his voice saying in a loud whisper, "I'll go with him. He's pretty well finished." So he took Loiselard by the arm from behind and stared him forward to the dais and was thankful to see that the president, realizing the state of affairs, was not waiting for him to mount the steps to the table, but was coming round to the top of them with a sword. And here, with a word or two of congratulation, he laid the weapon in its owner's hands. Aymar lifted it to his lips, tried to say something, and then, clutching it to his breast, reeled suddenly backwards into the arms of Laurent and Dutrompley, 
who, already on the watch, had jumped down from his place at the end of the table. He was indeed finished, but they kept him on his feet until, someone producing a chair, they lowered him into it, and Laurent, kneeling by him with his arm round him, disengaged the sword from his grasp. In another moment, Monsieur Pigalet was bending over him. Oh, give him time, gentlemen. How oh, unfit for this. A great strain. But he will be himself again in a little. Nevertheless, he had thrust his hand inside the breast of Emarque's uniform. A water? Yes, thank you. And Emarque's head lay against Laurent's shoulder. And Laurent, who rather thought he was crying himself and didn't care, who was battling with a most unseasonable desire to kiss it, and there, before everyone, and would very likely have succumbed, only that he was sure a man had not quite lost consciousness. Meanwhile, the court had broken up into little groups. The audience, and though deeply interested, and disposed to quit their seats, kept their distance. And in a short while, after a period of being finally confused at what had happened, a man had recovered, and stood up, and Laurent, with shaking fingers, fastened on his sword. He and no other, no other save he had even touched it. And nursing that smaller joy amid the greater, he stood away watching the little scene of congratulation that ensued, members of the court and of the audience alike, crowding round that central figure to shake hands. So he witnessed the long grip, the long wordless look, which Du Tremblay gave. Last of all came Don Digny, with that fine smile, and said something in a low voice which Laurent could not catch. But he saw a mag flush, and knew that it was with pleasure. But he did hear the general say, And then, you will give me the pleasure of your company at supper tonight, as a proof that you bear me no ill will, Monsieur de la Gorgeterie. I would suggest, in order to spare you the fatigue of the return journey from Carmelven, where I am staying, that you spend the night at my chateau, and I shall give myself the privilege of sending the carriage for you. I should like, also, he went on, to extend the invitation to your friend, Monsieur de Courtemag, whose acquaintance I am anxious to make. Aimag turned and beckoned, and Laurent, as he was presented, braced himself for the ignominy of confessing that he was not in a position to accept this glorious invitation. Aimag would not remember his disability. But what was he saying? I am afraid, General, and that Monsieur de Courtemag will be unable to have the honour of supping with you, unless you can put in a word for him in the proper quarter. I regret to say that he is under arrest. Monsieur Dondigny's keen gaze turned on the culprit. Oh, dear me, what for? Because, said Aimag, half smiling, he had a difference of opinion with an officer of Monsieur de Magadel's last night, and as the officer is in bed this morning, and likely to remain there. Oh, I see, said the Chevalier d'Andigny, with a twinkle. Oh, I think that can be arranged, Monsieur de la Gorgeterie. Yes, I can take that on myself. Our little festival would be very incomplete without Monsieur de Courtemag. Of course, he will honour me by staying the night also. He turned directly to Laurent. Oh, I think I can guess what the difference of opinion was about, can I not? And as Laurent did not answer, he put his hand for a moment on his shoulder and gave it a little pressure. After which he asked Aimag if he would be so obliging as to make him acquainted with Colonel Richard with whose general he had been having some correspondence about combining to keep the unnecessary Prussians out of Brittany. So a mag crossed the hall with him. Meanwhile, Monsieur Pagalet had requested de Fresne to procure a carriage. We will drive him home, he said to Laurent, and drawing him aside. Oh, my dear boy, that ramrod story. And I had deserted him. You had no doctor for those burns. There were tears in the little man's eyes. Oh, come, responded Laurent. Madame Allard and I did not do so badly, doctor. I shall set up in your line some day. He spoke thus hilariously, because, really, his eyes were in much the same state as Monsieur Pigalet's. It was so wonderful, so adorable of a mag, 
in the midst of his own triumph and relief, and to remember his plight, and to be collected enough to seize the one available opportunity of getting him out of it. De Fresne here came back and reported that there was a large and enthusiastic crowd gathered about the steps outside. There's no doubt, he added, in a satisfied tone, that the finding of the court is popular. As he said it, Don Digny, Colonel Richard, and Aymar all returned their way, talking together. I should be most willing, monsieur, came the imperialist's voice. If we combine, foes that we have been, it could be done. We are all Frenchmen. I know that General Lamarck is most anxious to do it. We will enlist Loiseleur also in the task, said General Dondigny. But I I have no men now, said Aymar, colouring. You have what I once wished you, monsieur, if you remember. Your sword again, said Colonel Richard. Oh, it's your brains, your advice, that I want, monsieur de la Rochetterie, said the royalist. It will be a matter of arrangement with our allies, after we have come to an understanding with our compatriots. We can talk about it this evening. And if only you had the famous Chactillier back, we could try the effects of that on the Prussians. Oh, but I have got it back, confessed a mag, and it is mended, and I am wearing it at this moment. It is at your service. Mended, eh? said Don Digny. How magically, no doubt. Aymar suddenly wheeled round and put his hand on Laurent's shoulder. Yes, magically, he said. He mended it, like a good many other things. His smile pretty well finished Laurent. To cover his confusion, he went out to the steps. His appearance was a signal for a burst of cheering, which very quickly drove him in again. The crowd was much larger and more expectant than he had realized. He clutched a mark, just turning away from Du Tremblay and by the arm. How can you hear them? he asked. In England, you know, we should take the horses out and drag the carriage. I wonder if Monsieur de Fresne and Pagalet are game. I am, observed the little doctor gaily, but a mag, beginning to move rather unwillingly towards the door, observed that for nothing on earth would he trust himself behind Laurent as a horse in his present frame of mind. You might take the bit between your teeth and bolt again, he added, with a meaning smile. And he put a hand on the culprit's shoulder and gave him a little shake. Oh, I don't believe you are an atom penitent, either. And what was so unpardonable, Laurent, was the inexactitude. I told you so many times that it was not red-hot. <laughs> Laurent choked back a queer sound. Oh, Aymar, you really are impayable. <laughs> What's the matter? Aymar had caught sight of the crowd. Oh, must I go through that? I would rather face a ramrod again. I'm afraid you must, said Laurent, and seeing that de Fresne and Monsieur Pigalet and du Tremblay were close behind Loiseleur, he darted down the steps to open the carriage door. So, without meaning to, but with delight, he saw the picture he should unendingly possess for his own. Aymar coming down the steps after his ordeal, neither triumphant nor abashed, but just his own quiet and gallant self. He had so much eyes only for that descending figure in its beautiful and unconscious perfection of poise, that it was not till afterwards that there came to him out of memory the stored scraps he had heard from the populace as he waited there, among people who wanted to shake hands with him, too, which rather bored him. How oh, he would not tell. He saved Monsieur du Tremblay. How oh, that's Monsieur du Tremblay himself. How oh, they say he was actually tortured. Oh, how pale he looks. I knew a man who was with him in the Moulin Brûlé, and the only other actual visual impression he retained, that of a middle-aged Breton with a firelock slung across his goatskin, reverently removing his broad-brimmed hat as a mag passed, and the Chouan who had spat at him yesterday. Thirteen. Laurent was in crazy spirits during the meal which followed at Madame Leblanc's. Particularly did the good Monsieur Pigalet appreciate his sallies, and even de Fresne, who made the fourth, 
relaxed into amusement. I shall no longer be a guest at that disgusting convent, and tonight we shall both be Monsieur Dantigny's prisoners. How do you imagine, Amag, that old de Noirlieu will be there? A prisoner, too. Oh, I wish Guiton Cadé could be, as a footman. I shall go and serenade him with the news this afternoon, and I shall write to Rigaud, and he can tell them all at Arbel. Oh, I forgot, Arbel is evacuated. And, in any case, observed a mag, and they would only say that St. Sebastian. Laurent dropped his knife and fork. His jaw dropped also. Oh, where on earth? I always hoped that you never knew. Oh, my dear Laurent, replied Loiselurg, smiling. Your walks on the terrace did not give you the monopoly of the bon mot of Arbel. I also had the privilege of hearing them during my one visit to the library. Of course, said Laurent, when he had got over this. It was really Monsieur Pigalet who turned the scale, not Monsieur Dondigny at all. Oh, imagine being able to hurl about missiles like ecchymosis and hemorrhage. I'm considering adopting the first as an oath. Oh, I think, observed Monsieur Pigalet, wiping his eyes, for his was not an exacting sense of humour, that you had better go and work this off outside, my boy. I cannot allow you to remain in the house, because a mag, he made no bones about the Christian name, is going to bed this afternoon, so as to be in trim for the evening. So, a little later, a mag, lying on his bed, looked up at the young man and the old, and remarked that they were both of them nothing but tyrants at bottom, and that when they got together, one was simply crushed. And not, he added, shutting his eyes, and that the process is altogether repugnant, Oh, I wish, my poor boy, said Monsieur Pigalet softly, that I'd been there to tyrannize over this. And he gently drew his hand down his right arm. Before Aymar could answer, he had left the little room. Laurent stood a moment longer, and then he suddenly dropped on his knees and hid his face against the bed. Oh, Aymar, at last, at last... Aymag gave a long, deep, tired sigh. Oh, it was wonderful. And his coming like that. A miracle. You were wonderful, said Laurent unsteadily. And perhaps that evening was the most wonderful of all. No more efficacious method of rehabilitation could probably have been devised than that supper with General Dondigny and his staff, where Loiselurg was plainly the guest of the evening, and where yet the host, with exquisite tact, so arranged matters that it seemed the most natural thing in the world that he should be there, and not a festivity with an object. And, in Laurent's eyes, the unanswering patience, courage, and dignity which Aymag had displayed throughout the inquiry, against the perpetual odds both of bodily weakness and of circumstance, found here something of their fitting recognition. In the seventh heaven himself, he thought that, despite the marks of strain, of illness, and of fatigue, there was no one in the room, except possibly Monsieur Dondigny himself, who could hold a candle to him for distinction. And there were moments when he looked as he had done before the catastrophe, when he might indeed have been the Aymag of the Paris reception. But he would never be quite the same again. And to Laurent, at least, he was even more admirable. Yes, he had come through the sombre forest at last. He had everything back again now. All but one thing, probably to him the most precious of all. Very late that night, after the guests had dispersed, Laurent went into the room near his, which had been assigned to his friend. It was a room so large that two candles had little effect on it, but the moon was streaming in also through the uncurtained window. And across the majestic four-poster he perceived, by the gleam of his shirt in the moonlight, and that Aymag was sitting on the window-seat, partially undressed. But his head was down upon his arms on the sill. Laurent hesitated. He had not meant to intrude on this. And perhaps, however, he was asleep. Not liking to turn back, either, 
He went slowly on past the column of the bed, and by the time he had got round the foot, Loiselov had lifted his head and was looking at him with a little smile. "'I'm not in bed, Laurent,' he asked lightly. "'And you?' retorted Laurent. "'How think of what Monsieur Pegalet would say after such a day? Oh, it must be about two in the morning, I fancy.' Oh, it has been an evening, certainly. Did you enjoy it? Oh, what do you suppose? inquired Laurent. Oh, but, a eh, mad, it was indescribably mean of you to tell them about that silly dungeon and my going back for Monsieur Perrelet. Oh, you must have known that I was trying to stop you. A eh, mad made no reply. His smile, however, was sufficient commentary. Oh, confound you, cried Laurent, laughing. Well, now you know what it feels like, and I got it over quickly. Oh, really, eh, Mac? I'd no idea you were so vindictive. Oh, I am a mine of evil qualities, announced eh, Mac. You ought to know that from Arbel. Oh, how long ago that seems now. You remind me, standing there with your candle, Laurent, of further back still, of the night I spent under your roof in Devonshire, centuries ago, when you were so polite. You hoped I would sleep well, which I did. And I could not believe I was not dreaming and to have you there. It was then I saw the swan and the motto on your watch. And a mag, his voice shook a trifle, and he sat down suddenly on the window seat. Your motto is true. You are sans tache. You always have been. A mag shook his head, smiling a little sadly but he looked at him with great affection. Now, if ever, was the chance to say something about Madame de Villecresne. How pleased they will be at Sassini, remarked the diplomatist, looking carefully out of the window. And the observation sounded in aim to him directly he had uttered it, particularly as Aimag made no reply. It was no use trying to work round tactfully to the subject, and there was always the picture of Madame de Villecresne eating her heart out there, now that she was enlightened. Besides, what of Aimag's own tell-tale attitude when he came in? So he next said boldly, I suppose you will go home now. No, I am not going home, replied Aimag, and he also looked out of the window. After a moment he turned his head. His pallor was accentuated almost to ghastliness in the moonlight. Oh, I cannot very well do so. I told my cousin, when I wrote about the inquiry, that whether I were cleared or no, I should not come back, and that I hoped she would continue to make Cécine her home. I should not trouble her. Laurent was now terribly bothered. What was the right thing to do? Oh, but don't you think, he began, and then floundered desperately. A hey, Mac, I think I ought to tell you. Yet, I don't know whether I had better... I, I really wish you would advise me whether to tell you. And unconscious of the absurdity he was uttering, he caught hold of A hey, Mac's coat, which lay on the window seat, and began to ring a button round and round. A little smile dawned on A hey, Mac's mouth as he looked at his occupation. <laughs> better tell me before you have them all off. I... I talked to Madame de Villecresne after you left. I... I had no choice. I had to make things clear. She... She had not understood, Aimag. She really had not. Sometimes, said Aimag very slowly, and dropping out each word separately. I... have hoped that, since... Yes, responded Laurent eagerly. You see, when you explained to her, and there was so little time, it was so sudden, all so horrible, and you never do yourself justice. So I... She asked me, you know, and I could not go away like that before she did understand. I explained. So you explained, repeated his friend. And that was like you, Laurent. He put his hand abruptly to his throat got up with equal abruptness, and walked away out of the wash of moonlight. He had told him, now that Imag knew that she knew the truth, and now, surely. 
Amag reappeared with startling suddenness, like a ghost. Hadn't we better go to bed, he said, in a dry voice. Lokong jumped up and held out his hands to the ghost. Amag, if you blame me. I blame you? How could you think such a thing? Don't I know and that you would make out a case for me a thousand times better than I could myself, and that you would do it so that it must be believed, if any truth in this world is to be believed. And that is just why. Oh, never mind. Why talk of it tonight? Oh, let us go to bed. But Logon had laid hold of him. Hey, Mac, oh, I'm so stupid. Oh, for pity's sake, tell me what you mean. Why? answered a mag, very quietly standing still in his grip. And just this. She understands now, and it has made no difference. Logon loosed him, aghast. By telling him what he had done, he had taken away his friend's last hope. He dropped back onto the window seat. A mag sat down there, too, and leant his head against a mullion. You see he said evenly, that this is a just inference, for she's had plenty of time to write to me, even if it were only to wish me good success. And I've not had a word. Or she cannot be ill, or my grandmother would have mentioned it. And so it is not my ineradicable pride, as you call it, Laurent. I'm certain that you put things better for me than I could ever have done myself. Another debt, of the deepest it might have been of all I owe you. But it only shows that she has washed her hands of me. I dare say she has cause. The moonlight enshrined the two silent figures. Amag had his chin cupped on his hand as he looked out of the window into the warm night. But before Laurent's eyes was the rose garden at Cécine and the little white-clad figure and the misty eyes and the trembling voice. Yet nothing had come of that emotion, after all. Amag turned at last and put a hand on his. Oh, my dear Lokong, one cannot have everything. And don't, oh, don't look like that. It is not for me to show myself ungrateful for this wonderful day. Oh, I don't think that I quite realize myself yet, and that I'm no longer an outcast, and that must be my excuse. Logon gripped the hand very hard. I knew the luck would turn, he observed, rather huskily. And no one could go on having such appalling bad fortune as you, since you lost the Shaktiyi. Oh, I suppose, said Imag softly, that it has never occurred to you in your imaginative moments. No, I'm certain it is not, and that all the time I had something a thousand times better than the Shaktiyi a piece of such transcendent good fortune, and that I might well spend the rest of my life thanking God for it. Oh, what do you mean? exclaimed Laurent. No, certainly it is not. Oh, still, of course, you were very lucky in having an opponent of the type of Colonel Richard, and again in coming across him, as you did, at... He stopped, because Aimac was gently shaking him. How is it nature or art, Laurent, that has made you so thick-headed? You don't know what I mean? Well, go and stand in front of your looking-glass, and perhaps it will dawn upon you. But it dawned then and there, for as he stared at him, Laurent slowly began to turn crimson. End of section 31「Section 32 of the Wounded Name » by D. K. Broster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Read by Eileen. Chapter 10. Son Tash. Quote, Will you leave me here, so wrong, so proud, so weak, so unconsoled, so mere a woman? And I love you so. I love you. End quote. E. B. Browning, Aurora Lee. Did he do right? Did he do right to go? Virginia de Coutomag asked herself 
on this the ninth day after her son's departure. Yes, of course, he had done right, but had he done wisely? And they are not always the same, she thought. And then, oh, you foolish, faint-hearted mother, you ought to be proud of having a son who does not count the cost of devotion. And she was proud. She had made no attempt to hold him back. Had he not told her, at last, with all the rest, of an arm with five burns upon it. Moreover, there was always that flooded river. And of his friend's innocence she had no doubt. But supposing he could not establish it, it was not only on Lokong's account that she had shivered as she thought of what had been going forward these last few days at Oran, a sort of bois de fauvette over again, as Lokong had put it. But Lokong himself would be there this time. Yes, indeed, she was glad that he was with Loiselog in his ordeal, but still she was a mother, a foolish mother, no doubt. And the general's words had been very weighty that day in the salon. Logon could hardly have flouted them more openly and more immediately than he had done. No, Logon cared nothing for himself and his reputation where his friends was concerned. Logon who, as he had so absurdly remarked on the day which saw the beginning of all this enslavement, would never be a mother. Oh, dear boy, said the Comtesse de Cotomac, and went and worshipped the recent miniature of him on her table. No woman, she was sure, had ever had a son like hers. It was just possible that today would bring him back, and that tomorrow they could start for their stay at their country house in Picardy, as they had arranged without the ants. They would have a delightful autumn, with plenty to occupy them at Cotomac. But she paused on this thought. Yes, it would be delightful, provided that Logon did not return from Brittany broken-hearted. If Monsieur de la Gaucheterie were not cleared, he would be broken-hearted. What, in that case, was she to do with him? But, of course, Loiselag would be acquitted. Yet, he had really sent the letter, and, of course, for the sake of a woman. Back came the memory of that evening in Devonshire, when she had begun her clumsy remark, and he had replied that there was no danger. How oh, dear me, reflected Madame de Cotomag, sighing. We women, it is not only as mothers that we are to be condemned. And this one, and did not understand. Well, I think from my recollection of him that I could have understood anything that Monsieur de la Gaucheterie had done. Oh, I have that amount of infatuation in common with Logon, at all events. And to her thus congratulating herself entered a domestic. Will Madame receive? The card was presented to her. Madame la Comtesse de Villecresne. How oh, the Comtesse de Villecresne! ejaculated Madame de Courtemar. She remained speechless for a moment. Yes, of course. Where is she? In the large drawing-room? Ask her to be so kind as to come here to my boudoir. She could not have been more astonished had she learned that the Empress of China had called upon her. Madame de Villecresne herself. She, precisely, who had not understood, who had been so cruel, but who was not to be blamed for it. Laurent's dictum. The pale girl who came in did not look like an empress, nor like a woman who could be cruel, nor even like one who did not understand. She looked as if she understood two things only too well, loss and a regret unutterable and hopeless. That comprehension spoke so clearly in her whole appearance that it caught Madame de Courtemag by the throat. Oh, you poor thing, her heart cried. But one did not begin like that at a first call. Rather, how kind of you to give me this opportunity of making your acquaintance, madame, when the visitor was seated, and the august sun came in from the Rue Saint-Dominique on to her wonderful hair. Now I can thank you for all your kindness to my son during his stay at Cécine, of which he has so often spoken to me. Oh, it was your son who was kind to me, was a voice unexpected rejoinder to this. And she went on, looking at Madame de Courtemag with the saddest eyes the elder woman had ever seen. 
If it were possible, I should like to have the opportunity of speaking to him again. Oh, it is not I whom she has come to visit, at all, reflected Madame de Courtemart. Oh, it is Logon, and to find out, of course, what has happened at Oran. Oh, I am so sorry, she said gently, but my son has not yet returned, and I have heard nothing. I think, however, that we may expect him to-morrow, or even possibly to-day, and if you will allow me, he shall wait upon you at once and let you know the verdict. But, of course, it will be favourable. The bewilderment in the eyes gazing at her was succeeded by terror. A verdict? What verdict? Oh, good heavens! And did she not know? Well, she would have to tell her now, having blundered into it. Logon is at Oran with your cousin, madame. Monsieur de la Rochetterie asked for a court of inquiry. If he has not informed you, it was no doubt that he wished to spare you unnecessary anxiety, and I regret very much that I should have mentioned the matter. But, of course, he will be acquitted. Must indeed be already acquitted by this time, and we shall soon hear the news. One great effort did a visitor make to save appearances. I left Cecine so unexpectedly, she said, with a formal air and a piteously trembling lip, and that the news has not followed me. Or perhaps I shall hear. It was no use, and the strained voice broke. Aymar court-martialed. Aymar, she whispered to herself and covered her face. Madame de Courtemar impulsively put out a hand, but it was not seen, and she withdrew it. No, no, madame, it is not a court-martial. Monsieur de la Gauchetterie asked for it himself. He is not under arrest, I know. Besides, I am sure it can only be a matter of form. He must be acquitted. Behind the shrouding hands, the girl was quietly weeping. Madame de Courtemar rose and went to the window and stood there thinking. Since Avoy de Villecresne knew nothing of the business at Oran, which in itself was strange. It could not have been anxiety as to the verdict which had brought her here in the hope of seeing Logon. It must just have been hunger for some tidings of the lover of whom, now, she knew nothing. Since his friend might know, she had come, a suppliant, for some crumb of information, how to be presented with this. Her poor child, her poor child. In a little, Virginia de Courtemar became aware that her visitor had regained command of herself, and she came back to her place. Oh, I cannot blame myself enough, madame, she said, as she sat down again, for having inadvertently thrown away, as it were, Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's consideration for your feelings. I shall have to make my peace with him, she added, more lightly. A voice face was suddenly flooded with color. What? Are you expecting him here, madame? Oh, no, responded madame de Courtemar instantly. No, I wish I were. I share my son's admiration, you know, for monsieur de la Gauchetterie. At my age, unfortunately, one can confess it to a penchant for a young man. My son's devotion to your cousin, which dated, I think, from the first moment he set eyes on him, is quite comprehensible to me. I am glad he's with him now when no woman can be. Oh, it is not the first time, murmured Avoy, and she fixed her eyes on Logon's miniature. What would Aymar have done there in captivity without your son? Oh, he would have died. Oh, madame, he has told me of that wonderful devotion and that never tired. Night after night, day after day, not only when he was so near death, but for weeks afterwards. And he your son, unused to anything of the kind. I found once or twice in my life, madame, said Virginia de Courtemar softly, that a man can be tenderer than a woman on occasions. I like to think that my Logon belongs to that company. But a boy had caught her handkerchief to her mouth and looked away. Oh, good gracious, thought her hostess, was ever anyone such a blunderer as I this afternoon? She must think that I am contrasting her behaviour over the whole business with Logon's, which was not in the least my intention. Not to leave time for this reflection to sink in, she hurried on, 
harking back to her visitor's question of a little while ago. No, I expect Monsieur de la Gochetterie is on his way back to Cécine now, with this unfortunate affair no more than a bad memory. Did Monsieur de Courtemac say that my cousin intended to return there if the verdict was favourable? No, I only assumed it, madame, as the natural thing. There was no indication of a subsequent plan, I believe, in his letter to my son. But a boy leant forward. Are you sure there was no sign of what he meant to do if the verdict was not favourable? Madame de Courtemac suddenly got up and seemed to consider that a vase of flowers near Laurent's portrait needed attention. The fact was that she had suddenly and very vividly remembered Laurent telling her of such an indication, and she was afraid that her face might betray her. She did not want to pass on the knowledge to that poor child. And yet, was it not her duty? For really, if Loiselard did come to that desperate step, and took it quickly, sailing perhaps from Nantes or La Rochelle, he might well be out of France before ever Madame de Villecresne could see him again, unless she were warned. Your cousin did say, I believe, she murmured, that if the verdict were unfavourable, which, of course, is unthinkable, he should probably leave France altogether and go, possibly, to the United States. Every remaining vestige of colour went from Madame de Villecresne's face. Oh, but of course, dear Madame, went on Virginia, glancing at her anxiously, and that possibility is not worth considering. He's bound to be acquitted. And she made another attempt to lighten the atmosphere by adding, half laughing, oh, for purely selfish reasons, I'm glad to feel so certain of that, for otherwise Laurent would probably want to accompany him to America, and I cannot spare him. Her effort had no success. Gazing at her with a poignant directness and absence of concealment, a voice said, Madame, I envy your son more than anyone else in the world. He had his chance and took it, whereas I... Virginia de Courtemag could resist no longer. She stooped over her and possessed herself of her hand. Oh, my dear, surely it is not too late yet. Oh, forgive me. But I am so much older than you, and I do desire Monsieur de la Gauchetterie's happiness, which I am sure is bound up with you alone. And Avoy clung for a moment to the kind hand. Then she loosed it, as one who has no right to comfort. Yes, it is too late. He could not forgive the things I said to him that day. And I shall never see him again now. I have deserved it all, because I had so little faith. And he went through martyrdom for me. Martyrdom. He's going through it again now. That alone. And the inquiry, a mark being what he is, is enough to kill him. Only I do thank God that he is not by himself there, and that your son is with him. She rose, in a calm of despair more moving than tears. Madame de Coq de Mag, looking at her in pity, suddenly heard a door bang downstairs, and a voice. Was it? Oh, wait, madame, pray, do not go yet. That sounds like Laurent. If it is, he can give us news. A voice shrank back. Madame de Courtemac caught her hands. Oh, my child, have courage. It must be good news. Apparently it was. There was the further sound of a light foot running up the stairs. A voice outside saying cheerfully to someone, Is Madame la Comtesse in here? And a hand on the door. The mother of this presence left her visitor, who shrank still farther back towards the windows. The door burst open. Maman, maman chérie, me voilà. Yes, yes, of course it is all right. His sword given back to him untarnished, as the general said, and quite an ovation afterwards. A supper with Don Digny, no less. It was he who... Oh, first, I must tell you that I've brought back a friend from Oran with me, rather against his will. In fact, I had the deuce of a tussle over it. So you will give him a warm welcome, won't you? He can't run up the stairs like me, and so I came on in advance. But who is it, dearest? asked his mother, disengaging herself from the whirlwind. And you've not seen, Logon, that I have a visitor. But Logon had gone to the half-open door and flung it wide. 
the guest who could not run up the stairs had just arrived on the threshold. And there was a faint cry from the other side of the room. But Aimag only saw Madame de Courtemar. I really was brought by brute force. That must be my excuse, Madame, he said, smiling. To inflict myself on you was no part of my plans. It has been as near a case of kidnapping as I ever remember to have heard of. Madame de Courtemar, the tears coming into her eyes, gave him both her hands. Oh, my dear Vicomte, she said, rather unsteadily. And Aimag bent his head and raised her hands to his lips. It was at this juncture that Lugon became aware of Madame de Villecresne's presence. The shock in his state of effervescence was almost calculated to unseat his reason. But perhaps so many shocks in one room counteracted each other. Aimag was the only person who had not yet received his. At any rate, Lugon was able to cross the room and kiss Madame de Villecresne's hand. He did not quite know what he said to her, nor she, doubtless, what she said to him. Afterwards he had the impression that she never even saw him, her eyes being elsewhere. Lugon's went in the same direction, and so he saw Aimag receive his shock. He changed colour, stiffened a little, and bowed, but he showed no signs of advancing from Madame de Courtemag's vicinity. The Englishwoman outgeneraled him, however. Oh, come, Vicomte, she said, laying her hand for an instant on his arm. You will want a word with your cousin. It was a lucky chance that Madame de Villecresne was calling here today and can be the first to congratulate you. And making a little sign to Lugon, for his part ready enough to receive it, she slipped out by an unobtrusive door, followed by her son, and almost before they knew it, Aimag and Avoy were alone, in a silence. Forgive my intrusion, said Aimag quietly but formally to the carpet. Had I known that you were here? The sentence was fully completed by a slight movement of withdrawal. The court-martial, you were acquitted. I was acquitted. My honour is cleared, in the eyes of the world, at least. I succeeded in keeping your name from the public. If you really wish to hear any details, Monsieur de Coq de Mag will no doubt give them to you. He paused a moment and then added, Before I relieve you of my presence, I should be glad if you will tell me why you are in Paris. She tried to answer, but nothing came. Oh, if he would only look at her. But he kept his eyes resolutely averted. No. Of course, it is no business of mine, he agreed, still gently. I had hoped. Oh, but that was not very likely in the circumstances. I am sorry to have deprived you of a home, also. There is no more to be said. He bowed, and this time turned in earnest and walked to the door. But the room was long, and the faint, broken-hearted cry fluttered to him before he reached it. And me. And me. Too many memories clung about that name for it to pass unregarded. Aimag paused while the lips that had uttered it tried to say more and could not for tears. And slowly Aimag turned and came back to the little figure. Came much closer this time and now he looked at her at last. Why are you crying, Avoy? Why do you... Have you been ill? he asked himself as white as a sheet. Twenty minutes later a self-posted sentry, Logon, still leant over the balustrade of the great staircase outside. He had already beaten off Tante Clotilde, desirous of offering her congratulations on general grounds to the hero of Penescoué, and equally outraged and puzzled at being refused admittance by her great-nephew, and told with a nervous laugh that her felicitations might be premature. And now, it seemed a long time that they had been left alone in there. And those two. Or was it a hopeful sign, or no? Surely, surely. But when a mag was hers, in very truth, would he be less his friend? A surge of loneliness went over Lokung, but he fought it back. And what did that matter if Imag had his heart's desire? 
he heard the door open at last. He was afraid to turn round. Then he felt a hand on his shoulder, and a voice said, Laurent, and he did turn, to learn what Emag's eyes were like when he was really happy. Oh, she wants to speak to you, and to thank you. She owes you so much. Oh, but I, Laurent, how shall I? He paused as if to steady himself, and abandoning the sentence, merely whispered, Oh, friend of friends, and laid his hand over Laurent's, where they clutched the rail. And their eyes met, and Laurent knew, knew with certainty, and that he would always be that to him. That happiness would not loosen the bond which unhappiness had so securely forged. And then he suddenly perceived Avoy de Villecresne standing there beside her lover. And her face, too, was wonderful. But it was at him that she was looking. Oh, I shall never forget. Oh, she said, and held out both her hands. End of section 32 End of The Wounded Name by D. K. Broster